Good morning everyone and uh, welcome to our saunter through Solomon's Grand Experiment and we're on chapter 4 today so we're going to pray Lord thank you again today that you are still on the throne that you love us you're with us you're with us through this whole um, confusing chapter of our lives leave alone this conf confusing chapter of the Bible Lord and we, we are right in the middle of a very very confusing chapter and we ask you to help us and guide us in Jesus name Amen so yes if whoops if ever the book of Ecclesiastes had a resonance I think it's probably now I've just been catching two minutes of the news and thinking my goodness me it's really tough for people in business of all different kinds and people in areas where there's now gone into tighter restrictions and so on and so wherever you're watching from God bless you and be with you today and keep you and he is a rock and a fortress and a shield and a protector in the middle of all of this so good morning Kathy, Lorraine, Kev, Sarah, Caroline great to see you Caroline Great to see everybody. So chapter four then, he says, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold the tears of the oppressed and th they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought of the, I thought the dead who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both <laughs> is he who has not yet been born. Gosh. Where am I? I've lost my place, sorry. But better than both is he who has not yet been born and he has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw all the toil and all the skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> I'm very hot. <laughs> I've been running. This is a bad idea. I should learn that it's a bad idea to run before I do a saunter once. Right. So he says, again, I saw all the oppression that uh, that is done under the sun and behold the tears of the oppressed. And I was thinking about that. The oppression of people by people is probably the most miserable um existence and it's the it's one of the it, great evils that of the human race really is that our ability to oppress one another and it's always the powerful person who oppresses the the weak and the vulnerable and i was just thinking you know you can you can have oppression that comes from a uh, unjust government or a, a corrupt court or um, an employer who's just being um, unfair in their dealings um, with people and this is bad this is horrid and I can see <laughs> Sorry. Oh my. this is being watched oh my goodness me how embarrassing I'm sweating Oh dear. Oh my. I'm trying to talk about something really serious. And so here's the serious thing. I, I, I'm going to tell a story. This will sober me up. This, um, I was in um, Central Asia and I was visiting. Um, I was with the Catholic priest and we were visiting um, one of his parishioners. And we went to see this lady and she told us her story how she had been in this abusive, well, she was in this abusive relationship with this guy and literally, and because she, she, so she was married to him and because she was a Catholic and serious about her marriage vows, she, um, she would not leave him, but he was abusive to her and would come home and she could tell by the look on his face when she answered, when she opened the door to him what kind of reception she was going to get and she could tell and he would literally um, 
because he was so violent towards her, he would beat her. And when he was drunk, when he'd been drinking, and so when he came in the house drunk, she knew he was gonna, she was going to get a hiding. And uh, she said she could literally, when he answered the door, well, or sorry, when she answered the door, opened the door to him and saw his face, she would literally empty her bowels because she was so terrified of the treatment that she was going to get from this guy, her husband. That is oppression. It is going on all around the world. It happens in um, countries where there's corruption and um, unjust laws. Um, and it happens in businesses where the employees are treated badly. Um, we have sweatshops, don't we? I'm in one at the moment. We have sweatshops around the world where people are working to make us t-shirts for so we can buy them for one ninety nine from Primark or wherever it is. Probably not Primark anymore. I think they've had a big thing about it. But you know what I'm saying. Oppression is really horrid and it's cruel and wicked and it's part of the human condition and I hate it. And it's a if ever there was a need for the gospel of Jesus, the good news to the poor. Gosh, and Jesus, when he comes, one of the first things he says in Luke 4 is, I've come to bring good news to the poor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So when Solomon is writing this stuff, he's a powerful man. He's capable of ending oppression, you would think. Um, and... Uh, I really would like to get a different TV on. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. It's in vanity, isn't it? Vanity of vanities, Paul. Um, and he, he obviously has got the power to end oppression, but it's still going on. It's still happening. He's still seeing it, even in his kingdom, with all his wisdom, with all his power, and with all his prosperity, oppression is still a reality and I think it's really important that we understand that that even in the most prosperous cultures in the world oppression is still going on and even if Solomon was a great king and never oppressed people however I doubt it I'm sure he did oppress people himself um, reading between the lines with his slaves and everything else and his concubines I mean that is a form of oppression in itself isn't it and he's saying, this is really bad. And he says, I wish, you know, sometimes it would be better not to have even been born than to live in that kind of oppressive culture. And then he says, verse four, I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbour. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. He says, do you know what? Even the desire to go to work, to earn money and to get skill and to improve and everything else. He says, that's all motivated by envy. I think he's a bit jaded. I don't think it is entirely motivated by envy, but of course it drives a lot. And the whole thing of marketing and advertising is all about making us want a better lifestyle and do you know what? Some preaching and some uh, cultures around Christianity have grown up creating a kind of covetous kind of I need more, I need more, I need more kind of acquisitional culture. And it's a bad thing. And, and it's, it, but it is a powerful driver. That's what Solomon's saying. It drives people to do better. It drives people to become skillful at their work because they want to have what somebody else has got. And so this is, he says, this also is vanity and a striving after wind. And of course it is. Of course, envying someone's car or their lifestyle or their holiday is vanity, isn't it? Of course it's vanity. Solomon says this is vanity, it's striving after wind. It's literally, we're just going after something that is um, so transient and so it's bogus, it has no real lasting value. And then meanwhile he says, verse five, the fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. So the fool really is, because he's not getting to work and not getting out and doing anything, he's the other extreme, if you like, he's not motivated, he's just sitting there or she, 
and no motivation whatsoever and all they do is consume their own resources until they've got nothing left, until they've consumed themselves. So, um, verse 6. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother. Yet there is no end to his toil and his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. He's saying, do you know what, even people who haven't got anyone in their lives to work for, to store up for, to lay up a kind of inheritance for, or to buy land to pass on to, he says, do you know what, even those people, they're still there striving away, toiling. He says, gosh, this is so vain. This is all for nothing. This is just so, <sighs> and he can't. So he's kind of thinking about succession and thinking about the natural order is that we, at least when we die, we hand over what we've earned and we hand over our property to our children who will then live on the benefit of that. And hopefully that will provide them with a bit of a platform to kind of push out into their own enterprises and their own take on life and so on and provide for their own families with a bit of um, money in the bank or a bit of property or somewhere to live or something like that. It's a great thing and my parents left us a, a modest amount of money which helped us to buy this house um, which meant we could move from where we were which was tiny and we've um, which is a, a blessing but Solomon's saying there are people who work all this time all their lives and they don't have anyone to leave it to and he never even asks himself, why am I doing this? I think people do. I think some people do. But he's saying, you know, what, what on earth is going on? It's a vanity and an unhappy business. It's a sad state of affairs. So Solomon is doing a very, very good job of identifying the problem, isn't he? <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. I, I'm just, I've swallowed my pride now. I've got a sweaty t-shirt on, but I'm going to get this job done and I apologise I look a bit gross um, so uh, so he says um, it's his vanity really just to be labouring um, but he says verse 6 is an interesting one he says it's better to have a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after wind and there's a hint in there. He's saying, guys, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just learn to be content with a modest amount rather than feel like we've got to be striving and striving and striving to get to double, to double what we've got, if you like. But actually just making, just realising that all we're doing is chasing the wind. We're chasing vanity. We could learn to be content. Paul says that, the Apostle Paul, he says, I've learned the secret of contentment in any and every situation, whether I've got lots or whether I've got little, I've learned to be content. That is a great skill, ladies and gentlemen, we should learn and, <laughs> Kathy, you are my best friend. <laughs> oh dear, good morning, Clive, good morning, Fliss and Mike Stewart, great to see you guys. So then he says, verse eight, uh, verse nine, he says two, this is now we're sort of coming on to some useful life lessons, actually, although it's in the context of a bit of a depressing chapter. He says, verse nine, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, apparently, um, back in ancient times, there was an understanding that if you plaited a rope together or twisted it together in three, from three cords, it was so much stronger than a fat rope of that sort of similar kind of thickness. That, that somehow plaiting it or weaving it, sort of coiling it together, 
makes it super strong. And so we'll come to that. But he's talking about how much, how better it is when two, you have two than one. And when you're, I've always, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, didn't, didn't he? And it was like, they, I think we're braver and more courageous usually when we're with somebody. And it's not like we're acting up to them, but it's kind of like we borrow a bit of strength from them and courage. Um, a team of two is a good, it's a good team, isn't it? And um, he says, like, two, you have more return for your work when there's two of you doing it. It's like you egg each other on. And, uh, you, you know, you get more done. When there's two of you, you can say, like, for example, if you've got to go up and down a ladder and you've got someone like older guys, tradesmen and women um, often have an apprentice or someone who's got younger legs and they send them off to get this and that and the other. And it just gets more done than it, if the tradesman or tradesperson is up and down the ladder themselves trying to get it all together. And if you can get someone doing your running about for you, you can get a lot more done if you're a skilled person than if you're having to do all that yourself. And so he's understood this, but also there's just that teamwork thing. Teamwork makes a dream work, all the rest of it. The marriage partnership, of course, is com comes to mind, doesn't it? That there's something so beautiful about being able to share your life with somebody. And you really are on the same team and you've become more than that. The, the Bible says that when, you know, we become one flesh, we literally become, the two become one. And yet we're kind of coiled together in that amazing way that God, God designed us to be intertwined with each other and to become one flesh. And it does help. I was running the other day and I was running down Portland Hill and I was a bit tired and I tripped and fell. And of course, if you fall, boink, onto something that's 90 degrees from you, it's not so far. But when you're kind of going downhill, is even farther. And I skidded along and cut my arm. And it was like, and I was, so I was actually using my arm as a brake. And um, I was bleeding, but not like super bad. But it was kind of enough to think. I should probably get a ride home if I can. So I picked up, I had my phone, I gave Anna a call and she came and picked me up. And it's like, there's there's two, you, there was someone to come and get me. I had someone in my life to come and get me, which was really nice. And then she said, I think you should get someone to look at this. And so she kind of makes enough fuss, but not too much. So she cares for me, but she doesn't smother me and she, gets me into action when I might just kind of yeah, wrap it up in an old sock and tie it with string and that'll be all right. <laughs> she kind of makes me think a bit more and she, so two are better than one. And then he says at the end there, he just throws this in, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And it's like, there's that extra, extra factor with three, three in the equation. And of course, all the, Bible teachers will tell you that this is, this relates to marriage, of course it can, um, it's a, it's, it can be a team of three people do, doing well and, you know, kind of egging each other on and spurring each other on. Um, some, some people say, oh, three, three's a crowd, two's company, but three's a crowd. But if the third one is the Holy Spirit, then, whoa, you're rocking, aren't you? And um, in Malachi, it talks about God giving a portion of his spirit in their union. So in the union of marriage, that coiling of two people together, there's the third person, um, the Holy Spirit coiled in there. He gives them a portion of his spirit in their union, it says. And so that is just the best, isn't it? When you've got a marriage of two people and then the Holy Spirit is in there now. It doesn't even just, I think that promise is for any married couple that actually there is access to God in that relationship for that relationship to be even stronger. Even if your spouse is not a believer, I believe there's a promise in that verse in Malachi if you want to dig it out a portion of his spirit in their union. There is an anointing for marriage 
a special kind of prayer that God answers, which is God help me in this situation, help my marriage, bless my marriage, bless my husband, bless my wife, and so on. Right, moving on. So then he comes, so he talks about two lying together to keep warm, and if you're married, there are all kinds of interesting ways to keep warm, which I won't go into right now. Verse 13, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice, for he went from prison to the throne, and though in his own kingdom he had been born poor, I saw all the living who move under the sun, along with that youth who was able to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after wind. And I was trying to think, I don't, I don't even know who he's referring to now. Is this purely an idea that he's got in his mind? This poor person who, who was wise and wiser than a king who wouldn't accept correction... So that's that bit of it we can get. So it's better to be a poor youth who's wise. So a young person with less experience who's wise than a king with lots of resources and money, maybe Solomon himself, but who doesn't like taking advice anymore. So it's better to be the young poor person but wise than to be the old rich person but unteachable. Yeah, we get that. That makes sense. But then he then tells this little kind of parable of somebody who was young and wise and went from prison. <clears throat> Although he'd been born poor in his own kingdom, he went from prison to become the king. And he saw this king, this young person stood in the king's place became a ruler. Maybe someone like Joseph, perhaps, who was born as a shepherd boy into a shepherd family. I don't know, they were especially poor, but then famine came and he went down to Egypt as a slave and he ended up standing in the king's place, didn't he? And he became like the second most powerful person in the whole of Egypt after the king. And then he says, um, there was no end to the people, all of whom he led. So he had like colossal influence. And that was true of Joseph, wasn't it? He became incredibly powerful. He led loads and loads of people. He stopped the Israelite nation dying of famine. Um, and yet those who come later will not rejoice at him. <laughs> so he tells this story, this rags to riches story. And we're just getting excited and we think, oh, yes. Isn't that exciting? But then he says, actually, <laughs> the people who come after him will resent him. You know, the people, there will be people rising up underneath his rule, if you like, who won't thank him, who just want to get his job. And he says this to his vanity. <laughs> so we're back to where we were with it all being vanity. I'm just kind of clutching at something to get excited about in this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't so much, is there, except the bit about two lying together to keep warm and, you know, better but and all of that, that thing about relationship and marriage and strength in and so on. So it's a kind of bit of a bleak, um, <laughs> bit of a bleak chapter, except to say that we know. Let me just read you this. Let me just read you this. This is a good one. Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes into the synagogue at the beginning of his ministry and he picks up the scroll of Isaiah and finds a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And so we have this bleak 
scripture, this bleak chapter from Solomon, the wisest man in the ancient times. And it's so empty. It's so, it's, there's like kind of bits of wisdom in it. There's bits of helpful stuff, but mostly it's quite a bleak, comes back to this same kind of theme. All this too is vanity. It's all a puff. It's all hevel. It's all chasing the wind. It's all just like a vapour of breath. <sighs> and then it's gone. And yet, in the middle of that, we have this longing cry for freedom for the oppressed. And that comes in the person of Jesus Christ himself. And the same spirit that rests on Jesus rests on you and me. And he's anointed us with the same anointing. So although Solomon hasn't specially helped us get there, we know because we've read the rest of the book that actually Jesus is the answer to all those who are oppressed. So Lord Jesus, today we thank you. We thank you that you are hope for the oppressed and that you have called us and filled us, anointed us. You've Christed us with the same spirit to do the same job, to bring freedom to the oppressed. And Lord, today I pray that we, each one of us will be that. We will be a refuge. We will be a breath of fresh air to those who are oppressed. Even if our life is just hevel, it's just a short breath, let it count. Let it make a difference for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a wonderful day and God bless you and take care. See you tomorrow without a sweaty t-shirt on, I promise. <laughs> You've seen me at my sweatiest.